Aubrey de Grey. Well, that's interesting music to start the day. I'm not sure I'm going to be that exciting. Um, uh, but anyway, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for getting up so early. I know it's not so easy. I certainly didn't find it all that easy. Uh, but um, thank you for coming. I will be telling you today about possibly the single biggest disconnect in health. Um, and it's, it's quite a shockingly big disconnect. I'm not all, I'm also, um, you may be able to tell that I'm not originally from this country, uh, but I am not talking just about the USA, I'm talking about the entire world. There is a profound, fundamental, conceptual disconnect that pervades our health system, and I'm going to be telling you what it is and how we're going to fix it. Um, in particular, how we are going to benefit from fixing it in the sense of improving and indeed maintaining our, <clears throat> our health in old age. So, uh, that didn't work, let me try that again. Here we go, woo, that's a little bit too, here we go. So, um, I work on the biology of aging, I'm interested in doing something about it, and the reason I'm interested in it is fundamentally because aging is the single worst problem facing humanity as of today. And when I say that, what I mean is that it causes more suffering than anything else. At the end of the day, that's the way we can determine and define how bad a problem is. And of course, we have plenty of other rather bad problems, but let's face it, 110,000 people die every single day from the ill health associated with old age. 110,000 worldwide. That's more than two-thirds, about 70% of all deaths. And of course, in the industrialized world, it's closer to 90%. So that's pretty bad. And of course, the real problem is all of the disease and disability and decrepitude and dependence and general misery that precedes that. And of course, in most cases, that's um, a fairly extended period. So it's, it's a pretty bad problem. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, why have we been so unsuccessful in actually doing anything about it? Because let's face it, you know, 200 years ago, it wasn't that kind of problem at all. It was like, we you know, most of us would die of other stuff. In fact, more than one third of babies would die before the age of one, even in the wealthiest countries in the world. And of course, lots of people would die in childbirth and so on. And we fixed that by really elementary, simple measures, like, you know, figuring out that hygiene was a good idea and, you know, vaccination and, and really simple things. Even, you know, just mosquito nets have saved an insane number of lives. So we have to ask ourselves, why have the uh, aspects of age-related ill health been so much more challenging for medicine? And the answer that most people would give is this. Of course, you're not supposed to be able to read this slide. It just emphasizes that um, there is rather a lot that goes wrong with us during uh, late life. And these things all go wrong at more or less the same time, which means, of course, that they interact and exacerbate each other. It's a little bit of a um, scary business. And most people would say that this is the fundamental problem, that there is so much that goes wrong that um, you know the sheer complexity of the whole business actually is overwhelming. And that is part of the problem, but it's not the main problem. The main problem is the disconnect that I told you I was going to tell you about. <clears throat> and the disconnect is here. If you ask people, in what ways can somebody get sick? In other words, if you ask people for a taxonomy of sickness, then um, they will say something like this. They will say, well, there's infectious diseases, that's column one. And then there's genetic diseases, the things that a few of us inherit, and that's column two. And then there are the chronic progressive diseases, mainly associated with old age, column three. Alzheimer's, you know, most cancers, atherosclerosis, osteoporosis, macular degeneration, all that kind of stuff. And then, most people would say that way out here in the stratosphere, there is this other fourth category of sickness called aging itself, which consists of these rather nebulous, non-specific things like frailty and, you know, sarcopenia, that's the loss of muscle as we get older, and immunosenescence, the declining function of the immune system. That's the way that most people would put it. And it is tragically wrong in one very important respect, and I'll tell you why it's so tragic. Most people would say this. They would say, well, because aging is this kind of weird category out there that's not disease, it's kind of off limits for medicine. That there's no way that we could ever actually attack it, or even should attack it, because it's natural and universal. And, you know, this is completely different from the diseases of aging, column three in the last slide, which are curable and, you know, non-universal. That's how people think. But it's nonsense. 
This is what aging actually is. Now, I want you, I'm going to spend a little time on this slide because it's very, very important that you should, get, you should understand what I'm saying. First of all, look at the middle sentence. Aging is simply the accumulation of damage, self-inflicted damage in particular, damage that occurs and accumulates as an intrinsic side effect of the normal operation of the body, of our metabolism. That's all that aging is. It's the accumulation of self-inflicted damage. And the body can tolerate a certain amount of that damage and work perfectly well. That it's just set up to tolerate a certain amount. That's why people up to the age of, let's say, 40 or 50 are working pretty much as well as they did when they were 20 or 30. It's simply you know, the nature of the way the body is set up. But here's the thing. Everything I just told you about the definition of aging could equally be used as the definition of the aging of a car, or an aeroplane, or any other inanimate machine with moving parts. In other words, the top sentence, aging is a consequence of physics. Aging is not an emergent phenomenon of biology, like, you know, consciousness or stuff like that. Aging is simply a phenomenon of physics. There is no fundamental difference between the aging of a car and the aging of you and me. And that turns out to be a really important thing to get into your head, because it tells us what to do about it. If we use biological terminology, then we can say this. We can say that metabolism, which is, of course, the network of processes that keep us alive from one day to the next, causes damage throughout life, even starting before we're born, and that damage is essentially harmless for a long, long time, but eventually, late in life, the damage reaches a level of abundance that is pathogenic, and we get all the problems I mentioned earlier. That is all that aging is, and of course our goal, as I've tried to depict in, with these arrows that have a slightly strange shape, is to separate metabolism from pathology, to try to weaken that link. Now, this is the way that we ought to be thinking about the problem. You will see that this table looks rather like the table I showed you earlier. And in fact, if you look closely, you will find that all four of the columns are the same as they were in the original version. We still have infectious diseases, genetic diseases, diseases of old age, and the stuff on the left, on the right, sorry, um, the non-specific things. But the difference between this version and the version I showed you earlier is the location of the big, thick black line. That big, thick black line is now between columns two and three rather than between columns three and four. And that turns out to be a fundamental correction. Here's why it's so important. There are two reasons. First reason is it tells us <clears throat> that there is a huge disconnect with regard to the way we are currently addressing the things in column three. We are spending fabulous, you know, eye-watering amounts of money trying to deal with those things, but we're doing it under the assumption that the things in column three are rather like the things in column one. In other words, that we can cure them. You know, we can eliminate them from the body in the way that we might eliminate an infection, which is completely, obviously, complete nonsense, because the things in column three are side effects of being alive. I mean, they are the result of the accumulation of damage. They are parts of aging. So it's insane to suppose that we could actually address them by, um, you know, uh, by the same kind of means that we would address an infection. There's a second thing, however, that the relocation of that big black line um, tells us, which is that not only are the things in column three completely different from the things in column one, but also they're not at all different from the things in column four. There is absolutely zero biological distinction between the things in column three and the things in column four. The only distinction is semantic. The things in column three are the aspects of aging that we have chosen to give disease-like names to, and the things in column four are the ones that we have not. That is all. And that turns out to be rather a useful insight when it comes to figuring out what to do about the things in column three and indeed the things in column four. If you make that mistake, if you put that black line in the wrong place, this is what you end up doing, geriatric medicine. Geriatric medicine we may as well define as attacking the pathology of old age directly, in the same way that we might attack an infection directly. Trying to eliminate those pathologies from the body. And you, you only need to spend about a millisecond looking at this tiny little diagram to understand how completely brain dead that is. Metabolism is continuing to operate in old people. 
Therefore, the damage is continuing to accumulate in old people. Therefore, by definition, anything that attacks the consequences of that damage, the pathologies, is going to become progressively less effective as the patient gets older. It's just complete. I mean, a child could see this. It's insane that we spend so much effort on, on doing this. But that's what we do. Now, I am not the first person to point this out, although I may be doing it in somewhat more strident language than most people. The thing is that for more than 100 years, some people, a few people, have actually noticed this. And they've said, well, OK, there's only one thing that we can actually do to keep people healthy in old age, and that is to intervene at an earlier point in this chain of events. And that's where gerontology came from. The whole field of studying the biology of ageing came from that insight. At the end of the day, it's a reasonable insight, because let's face it, if we look at the living world, we see a lot of variation in the rate of ageing, the rate at which metabolism generates damage. Different species age at very different rates. Even within a species, uh, different individuals age at slightly different rates. So the idea was, well, maybe if we study this really hard, we can figure out what's going on. We can actually understand the nature of the creation of damage well enough that we can de develop therapies which we could apply to clean up our metabolism, to slow down the rate at which metabolism generates damage in the first place. If we can do that, fantastic, we will be postponing the age at which damage reaches this pathogenic level of abundance. Unfortunately, the gerontology approach to attacking aging has also been spectacularly unsuccessful for a completely different reason than the geriatrics approach, namely this. Metabolism is rather complicated. This. Uh, <clears throat> this here is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism actually works. And as you can see, it's a bit of a mess. Those of you who write software, or who ever written software, will immediately see that this is the ultimate you know, nightmare of, of, of uncommented spaghetti code. There's no way in hell that uh, we are ever going to be able to tweak this system so as to stop it from doing the thing we don't want it to do, i.e. the creation of damage, without at the same time having you know, unintended consequences that stop it from doing the things we need it to do to keep us alive. Not going to happen. So, that's a bit of a shame. And in fact, you know, uh, by the 1970s or so, people who were studying the biology of ageing had more or less drawn, come to that conclusion. And they'd more or less given up. They had come to the stage uh, that, you know, ageing is bad for you. You know, they were a bit like seismologists. You know, people who study earthquakes, they understand that earthquakes are bad for you. But they don't have any actual aspiration to doing anything about them, right? You know, you just get, kind of try to get out of the way. And it's the same with gerontology in the 70s and 80s. And it kind of stayed like that uh, for a while. Uh, but the thing is, it shouldn't have, because there is a perfectly simple and really pretty damned obvious third option that escapes the problems of the geriatrics approach and the problems of the gerontology approach. If we want to break this link between metabolism and pathology, we do not need to break either of the components. Of the, the component processes. We do not need to stop damage from generating pathology the way geriatricians are trying to do. And we also don't need to stop metabolism from generating damage the way the gerontologists originally tried to do. Instead, we can fix the damage. We can just go in and periodically repair this damage, eliminate it from the body. If we could do that, then we can leave metabolism alone. We can let metabolism generate damage at the natural rate which means, of course, that we don't need to understand metabolism any better than we already do. And, moreover, we don't need to understand pathology either. We don't need to worry about how complicated life is like late in life, because the fact is we won't let damage accumulate to the level of abundance that causes these pathologies. We will sit in that window of opportunity where the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of damage. That's all we need to do with the maintenance approach. Sounds spectacularly simple, doesn't it? And actually, to be perfectly honest, it is. Because the fact is, we already do that for simple non-living machines. This car, of course, is more than 100 years old. And the reason it's working just as well as it was when it was built, rather than having fallen apart at the age of 10 or 15, the way it was supposed to, is simply because it has been owned by crazy people who do a... <coughs> a spectacularly large amount of maintenance on it, a comprehensive job of preventative maintenance that simply removes the damage before anything happens, like the doors falling off. That's all it is. And because aging is a consequence of physics and is fundamentally the same thing in a car as it is in you and me, we should, in principle, be able to do exactly the same thing in the human body. 
So the question then is, can we in fact do exactly the same thing? And the answer is, it looks as though we probably can, and I'll explain <laughs> why in a minute. But first of all, I just want to tell you why you hadn't thought of this. The fundamental answer is because, because since the dawn of 